a very important seminar. Well, thanks. i uh, just start over again. Uh, Gary Singer, um, Chief of our Operations and Training Division. I want to thank everybody for being here on behalf of our General Manager, Carol Parks. Um, just thanks to the participants. Thanks to the panelists. This is a recovery-focused seminar, as uh, Callan mentioned. We wanted to shine a light on the recovery aspects of any emergency because it doesn't get the attention that the, the response phase or the preparedness phase uh, generally gets. So uh, recovery is crucially important. And even the within the recovery realm, uh, cultural and natural and cultural resources needs to get more attention. So uh, we made that a focus this year. Uh, it's important because getting a um, cultural or natural resource back up after a disaster helps the economy, it helps with cultural identity, it helps lift everybody's spirit. So being able to do that in a quick and efficient fashion is going to be very, very important. So while you're listening here, um, try to listen for what it is that your division, department, agency does that maybe isn't covered uh, so that we could write that into the plan or listen for what's actually covered here that you don't do that maybe you couldn't do in the future um, to help bolster your agency's ability to recover after a disaster. Uh, and as Callan mentioned, uh, we do have future seminars and we'll advertise those uh, down the line, but keep an eye out because in 2024, uh, we're going to be doing an adverse weather seminar with a focus on atmospheric rivers. We'll be doing a supply chain resilience seminar with a focus on mass feeding and hydration. Uh, we'll be doing an operational coordination seminar on safety assessments. And then our recovery focus for next year is going to be on the financial aspect of recovery, uh, focusing on individual assistance. Um, so I'll turn it back to you, Cal, and just uh, thanks uh, to you, Cal, for putting this all together, and I'm looking forward to this seminar. Thanks, Gary. So uh, Gary covered some of our objectives here. Uh, we want to raise awareness about uh, critical importance of care, uh, cultural heritage recovery, emphasizing its role in uh, shaping our collective identity as a city. Uh, we're offering a case study that will uh, illustrate immediate preservation, restoration, and rehabilitation efforts for cultural artifacts. And also uh, another key focus is long-term sustainability with an exploration of disaster preparedness and risk reduction strategies to ensure that our cultural heritage assets can endure. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and show share the agenda here. Um, the first, up, uh, first speaker up is Aparna, uh, Tandon, uh, I apologize, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Aparna, but uh, here's a small biography about Aparna. Aparna is a senior program leader at uh, ICCROM. She leads the strategic design, partnership development, uh, resource mobilization, as well as implementation of first aid and resilience for cultural heritage in times of crisis. Um, a flagship capacity development initiated uh, of ICCROM which has an expanding alumni network spanning over 100 countries. Parna has an MA in art conservation, and she specializes in disaster risk reduction, post-conflict recovery of all forms of heritage. She has developed disaster risk uh, management plans for key heritage sites, museums, and archives. Parna has led post-event damage and risk assessments, as well as in-crisis training to safeguard heritage in over 16 countries affected by disasters and conflicts. Over the past decade, Aparna has been working to integrate cultural heritage safeguards with humanitarian assistance, development planning, and peace building. With that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Aparna. Aparna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let you share. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I'm very pleased to be here and sharing uh, space with this illustrious panel today that you have put together. I'll start sharing my screen and... Uh, Yes. Hope you are seeing my screen. Okay. So thank you so much for inviting ICROM here. For those of you who do not know ICROM, ICROM is the International Center for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property. It's an IGO, an intergovernmental organization with 135 member states. 
and it's headquartered in Rome. And it was founded by UNESCO after the Second World War uh, to share best practices for restoration and recovery of cultural heritage and uh, also to offer technical advice to member states. United States is one of the uh, most important member states of ICRA. So I'd like to start with uh, something we all know and are realizing that today we live in a world where disasters, conflicts and pandemics or epidemics tend to overlap, destroying lives, livelihoods and cultures. Risk drivers such as climate change, rapid urbanization and unplanned development are exposing populations and their habitats to new or unknown risks, which are in turn increasing our vulnerability to conflicts and disasters. And although not fully consistent, uh, but there is data available uh, for economic or human costs of disasters and conflict but data on damage and loss to cultural heritage is scattered, insufficient, and inconsistent. This reduces our understanding of risks to heritage. It limits our ability to prevent future damage and leads to ad hoc responses. And that's what I have seen all through my career in these past 20 years. So how can we turn the tide and enhance prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery of cultural heritage? Well, we see it as an interconnected uh, issue. And ICROM's FAR, First Aid and Resilience for Cultural Heritage in Times of Crisis is purpose-built to enhance capacities for safeguarding heritage from conflicts, disasters, and climate crisis to build peaceful and disaster resilient communities. It builds on 10 years of ECROM's highly successful first aid to cultural heritage in times of crisis training. Our motto, culture cannot wait, is rooted in the idea that culture must be mainstreamed in development and humanitarian aid assistance aid as it is a source of shared identity, an enabler of peace, as well as it offers pathways for just climate action and helps build disaster resilience. Therefore, through our activities, we aim to reduce uh, disaster risk and conflict risks for heritage, enhance preparedness for its safeguard during a complex emergency, and leverage this work to promote peace contrib and contribute to just climate action. Participation, prevention, forecasting, and interagency coordination are at the core of all our activities. We also consult different data sets that are in public domain to prioritize risk-prone countries for planning and implementing our capacity development activities. We are developing tools and training to manage complexities and understand systemic risk to heritage. And when I say heritage, I mean all types of heritage. Heritage kept in museums, archives, libraries, at heritage sites, in buildings, and in community centers. And we consider overlapping risks of disasters and conflicts, considering all possible uh, risk drivers, as well as wider societal and underlying vulnerabilities when we are when we can, you know, undertake risk assessment. FAR training uh, engages multiple uh, or multidisciplinary teams composed of cultural heritage professionals, disaster risk reduction specialists, emergency managers to undertake comprehensive risk assessments at heritage sites. So we have developed methodologies for doing this work. The other aspect of our work, which is growing, is risk modeling. This involves sourcing data from multiple agencies and bringing together key disaster management stakeholders to develop disaster risk scenarios and that also include concerns for heritage in a given context. context. These scenarios are helpful in preparing institutions for likely and rare catastrophic risks and at the same time, 
Participatory scenario building helps to gather support from disaster management authorities such as civil defense and army for emergency preparedness and response of cultural heritage. We help heritage institutions to actually visualize complex and extreme risk scenarios by inviting hazard specialists. And we also use 3D simulations as well as existing documentation to help participants of our trainings understand how hazards from outside could combine with vulnerabilities inside their respective institutions to cause damage and destruction to heritage. In the event of a large scale disaster, we have often seen that local communities are the first line of defense. They come to safeguard their heritage. To better understand capacities held by communities to safeguard heritage and in which ways heritage is a source of resilience in times of crisis, we have developed a participatory heritage-centered vulnerability and capacity assessment exercise called INSIGHT. It enables local governments and heritage institutions to recognize capacities held by communities and engage them in disaster risk management for heritage. For example, while field testing this activity in Racha, which is a border province of Georgia, we found out that local communities, and not your Georgia, it's, I mean the Georgia as a country, we found out that local community identified their library as the most important place where they could get together as a community and share knowledge as well as traditional practices uh, such as farming and flood mitigation. One of the key challenges that we face is uh, that to mount uh, to, that that prevents us from mounting quick and efficient emergency response for heritage is the fact that culture is not part of the international humanitarian aid system that is replicated at national and local levels for directing aid. To counter this, ECROM together with UNESCO and some key member states uh, work to ensure that the protection of cultural heritage is included in the Sandai framework for disaster risk reduction. But despite this, when faced with extreme risks, heritage institutions lack capacities for mounting response. Often in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, access to heritage sites that are in the red zone or the zone where there is maximum damage uh, access is not granted to heritage professionals. On the other hand, it is also important to understand what response capabilities a cultural institution has and at what level the local institutional response capacity is annihilated. For example, we are working in Ukraine and all museums and cultural institutions in Ukraine have moved their collections in their basements. And many of these cities, uh, Ukrainian cities, are built over rivers, and the risk of urban flooding, as well as accidental failing of dams, is high. So they really need to understand what type of capabilities institutions must have to respond to cascading risk events in the ongoing war. To enhance interagency coordination and cooperation during emergencies and to increase the ability of cultural heritage institutions uh, to mount efficient and timely responses. FAR program has partnered with European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Organization as well as civil protection departments of Italy, Spain, France and Germany to promote joint training of civil protection and heritage professionals. A big policy win for us has been the unanimous adop adoption of our guidelines developed in partnership with UNESCO and ECOMAS by UN Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and its advisory group in Sarag, which will help inform search and rescue operations at heritage places. We have also tried to provide standardized guidance and we have tried to train uh, cultural first aiders, people who are cultural heritage professionals who are trained to provide uh, response to heritage, work in hazardous conditions, 
work in, in tandem with humanitarian aid and emergency aid uh, professionals as well as emergency managers. So far, we have trained um, over 1,000 cultural first aiders globally in 122 countries. To take on board the lack of consistent damage and loss data, we have developed systematic damage and risk forms for movable, immovable, and intangible heritage. I know this, some of my these categories may not be making sense to you, but I'm, I'm open to question. Um, we, we field tested them in 17 countries, these forms that we have created. To make data collection easy for our member states, we have also developed an open source application which will allow anyone who is using the app to set up their own server and store the data as well as incorporate it in their existing documentation system. Digital sustainability was our key concern whilst designing this app. And that is why we chose to base it on an open source technology. And our end goal has been that each member state of ECROM, as part of their pre preparedness must develop context specific damage and risk assessment forms and has a system in place to gather, gather data. In Ukraine, we are building capacities for heritage recovery and gathering data on damage and risk using the application. We have trained over 100 professionals on site. We have gone on site and trained them and the data gathered will help to build a first of its kind risk map to predict future risks. And this work is backed by the US Department of State and the European Commission. As uh, we also provide systematically technical assistance to our member states uh, that request us for help uh, during complex emergency situations or when they have they are um, you know affected by a large scale disaster. As UNDRR, that's the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Agency, has highlighted, early warning means early action. Through our Net Zero Heritage for Climate Action project, we are now field testing strategies, integrated strategies on how indigenous and traditional knowledge can help mitigate the impacts of climate change, as well as help develop early warning systems. And we are developing these early warning systems in Egypt, in Sudan, and in Brazil. Through an independent evaluation process, so I, how do we measure you know, all this that I have described? Uh, and I was asked uh, this question specifically. We, we, we conduct independent evaluations and we have tried to understand how our participants, all this work that we have done, how our participants have they changed their attitude or upgraded their skills. Well, uh, these evaluations are very positive and the numbers uh, on the screen speak for themselves. But to make it more real, I have brought the testimony of one of the our participants from Croatia, who is the head of conservation department of Trogir in the city of Croatia. So just let's listen to her. Prevent inspired a small scale city project, but during the course of post training follow up, something unimaginable happened. We turned it into a national program where the Ministry of Culture and Media joined forces with the National Firefighters Association in developing new projects where both fields could work together. Um, the most impressive part was the uh, interactive simulation where we were pushed outside of our comfort zone, but at the same time provided with the tools to take necessary steps and risks and make change in the field. Um, two years after the initial course, we're still taking bits and pieces from it, testing them in the field and building resilience and throw it. So that's Jasna Popovic, who has actually made a plan, a citywide plan for fire risk management in her city, Trogir, which is a World Heritage Site. And after that, her national government has incorporated uh, risk management of heritage as part of the national disaster risk management policy. So that, I think, is a very big uh, success for Yasna. Uh, I'll just, and more such stories of change are captured in a series of publication that we bring out every year called A Story of Change. You can look them up. 
But all this work would not have been possible without the ongoing help of, and support of our 132 partners. And many of them are institutions in US. So for that, we are extremely grateful to follow us more and to write to us. You can, uh, you can email us and follow us on our social media platforms. And thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you, Aparna. That was an awesome presentation to start start us off. So now we will open it to uh, questions. If anybody has any, please feel free to uh, use the Q and A function or type it in chat. And we are monitoring both of those. If there are no immediate questions, you can always email me or uh, Aparna um, and we can work to answer them at a later time. Okay, well, going once, going twice. All right. Uh, Arna, hold, uh, hold on, I, I had a quick question. Uh, uh, Arna, y your job, the job of UNESCO, the job of, uh, I, I mean, it's it's massive, you know, particularly when we see everything that's going on in the world, you know, beyond Ukraine, which, uh, which you're responsible yeah. for, obviously Gaza, but then we see some of the natural disasters in North Africa. Uh, all these things are happening. Um, we're prone to natural disasters here. I mean, we like to believe that we're not as much a, a conflict issue. But but what what you know for a place like Los Angeles uh, and for cultural institutions, what what are give me one or two things that we should focus on to make sure that we're uh, that that you would tell any place how to be prepared ahead of time rather than having to re, you know to, to look for people like you to come and help us no you don't need to look for people like me to come <laughs> and help i think you have a, a lot of people like me who are working in us so uh, just to make it clear uh, we have also been working in sudan and libya and right now we are mounting operations and in fact we had trained some people in libya ahead of this emergency and those people are now spearheading action in libya but uh, just to, um, I think one of the key things that I tried to also for, say through my presentation today was that uh, we need to work with city uh, emergency management authorities, disaster risk management authorities to do better risk assessments, more, uh, you know, taking into consideration existing vulnerabilities, not just inside the institution and exposures, but also from outside the institution, because some risks really emanate from the wider city level. And so that I think uh, we, are, uh, we have this sense of, you know, false sense of uh, that we can do it on our own. But when we have to be ready for those catastrophic or cascading risk events, as I have been trying to say, because, uh, because of our, some of our actions, we have already activated these risks. So I think that's first number one, to coordinate with uh, local um, meteorological agency, disaster risk management agency, and emergency management agencies to understand really the uh, spread of the hazard and how much uh, if institutions are exposed, then what actions to take. And also to really to understand how the hazard would grow quickly or how it would, you know. So those risk modeling, risk assessment is very important, comprehensive risk assessment and coordinated. The second aspect is to pool in resources between cultural heritage institutions and to understand how they can. Um, and I think US is pretty good at that. Lori Foley is here. So she will be able to tell you more about the cooperation that you enjoy between cultural heritage institutions. But the again, the problem is to coordinate at the city level and to work with city administrations. So that's another aspect. Then early warning systems. I think most heritage institutions lack good early warning systems or somehow they are not connected to the city early warning systems. So these are the three top things that I would recommend. Thank you so much. And yeah, risk maps, risk maps for heritage, yes. All right. Well, thank you again, Aparna. I think uh, we don't have any other questions. 
Um, it's been a pleasure having you here today. Uh, feel free to uh, listen in, uh, but um, I wish you uh, the best over, I believe you're in uh, Ukraine right now? No, no, I'm back in Rome, but yeah, tomorrow we have a big event. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. All right, so we're gonna move on to our next presenter. Um, Aparna uh, partially introduced her, but I'm gonna go ahead and introduce her myself. Uh, Lori Foley has been coordinating the work of the Heritage Emergency National Task Force since 2011, first at a private nonprofit heritage preservation and now at the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Before finally settling into her dream job at FEMA, Lori taught second grade, spent 15 years in trade book publishing, received a certificate in hand bookbinding from the North Bennett Street School, directed preservation services at the Northeast Document Conservation Center, and managed, it, and managed emergency programs at Heritage Preservation. She'll share her passion for promoting collaboration and inf information sharing between cultural stewards and emergency managers to protect the nation's cultural heritage and artistic endeavors. All right, I'll hand it over to you, Lori. Thanks, Cal, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, Aparna is indeed a tough act to follow. Um, I always think of her as the rock star of international cultural heritage protection, and I have learned so much from her. So I am going to start talking about protecting cultural heritage at the federal level. So let's see if I can figure this out. Okay. Perfect, perfect. So again, thank you for joining. I'm gonna be referring to the Heritage Emergency National Task Force by its acronym, HENTEF, because it's quite a mouthful. I'd run over in time and we at FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, we just love to use acronyms. So as HENTEF coordinator, I work similar to, to Aparna in that unique space where cultural heritage and emergency management intersect. HENTEF's mission is based on connecting the cultural community with the emergency management community. We both know that these communities have separate vocabularies and following any disaster, they have different priorities and procedures and protocols. These two communities need to understand each other and be able to work together to protect our cultural heritage. And this holds true from the local level, from the cities and municipalities all the way up to the federal level. As emergency managers are wont to say, all disasters are local and most disasters don't rise to the level requiring federal assistance. Thank goodness, I would need a couple of clones if that were the case. But when a disaster does require the support of the federal government, it's important to know how cultural institutions and arts organizations can and should function to succeed in both response and recovery. So I'm gonna provide a brief overview of what HENTEF is and does and how we support both cultural stewards and emergency managers. When does the federal government get involved in disasters? So you're totally familiar with FEMA's role in supporting states when they respond to natural disasters. And of course, you're well aware of past wildfires in California and the toll they've taken on lives and families and businesses, communities and natural resources. And with the unprecedented heat wave that happened this summer taking a toll on people and our planet, FEMA is now being urged to declare extreme heat events as disasters. An example of a human caused disaster is the Surfside condo collapse in Florida, which happened in 2021. We all are familiar with the September 11, 2001 act of terrorism um, on the World Trade Center towers. Uh, thanks to COVID, the term PPE now is a household world, word and uh, COVID is a public health emergency and continues to be. And national special security events include presidential inaugurations, Olympic games, and even the Super Bowl. I'm not sure about the current World Series. Maybe, maybe not. I haven't seen anything about it, but that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. As I noted, the majority of emergencies can be handled at the institutional level, the local level, 
or the state level. But when a disaster requires an even more robust response, the federal government steps in at the request of the state, territory, or tribe. The Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act, or the Stafford Act, gives the president the power to declare a national emergency in response to a national disaster. This declaration allows the president to access funds and disaster relief assistance that's set aside by Congress. The declaration is mainly intended to assist states, territories, and tribes while they carry out their responsibilities to aid their citizens. To help you understand the federal approach to disasters, I'm gonna provide some background information. FEMA divides the US into 10 regions. California is in FEMA region nine, along with Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, Guam, American Samoa, the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, the Republic of Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia. There's also a very specific process to declaring a major disaster. After an event occurs, officials at the state, territory, or tribe begin collecting information about damage from local officials. If it's apparent that a presidential disaster declaration may be necessary to help the impacted area, the state, territorial, or tribal government contacts their FEMA regional office and requests a preliminary damage assessment or PDA. It's called a joint preliminary damage assessment because it's conducted by the state and FEMA. These joint teams then begin conducting assessments of the affected areas. They're trying to determine the extent of the disaster, its impact on individuals and public facilities, and the types of federal assistance that may be needed. Dollar thresholds must be met in order to satisfy one of the many requirements for a major disaster declaration. For fiscal year 24, so that's what we're in FY24 right now, the indicator for a county is $4.60 per capita. LA County has a population of around $10 billion, so the county has to demonstrate a minimum of $46 million in damages. For a disaster affecting an entire state, that indicator is a little lower per capita. If the state determines that the damage is so overwhelming that it needs help to respond and recover, the governor, or tribal chief executive requests a declaration from the president through their FEMA regional office. The FEMA regional administrator, the head of that region, reviews the request and then sends its recommendation to the president. All emergency and major disaster declarations are made solely at the discretion of the president of the United States. So why does this matter to individual cultural institutions and arts organizations? Reporting damages to your local emergency manager regarding your facility and collections will enable them to roll that information up to the state emergency management agency in California, that's Cal OES, to include in the dollar amount of damages. Your input could mean the difference between your county getting FEMA disaster funding or having to pay for it out of its own coffers. For you emergency managers, the most damaging impacts Two cultural institutions might be to the objects, paintings, books, documents, natural history specimens, and so on that are housed within those facilities. For performing arts organizations such as theaters, the most damaging impacts might be to their auditorium or venue space, which leads to the loss of revenue generated by performances in that space. As of today, there are 76 major disaster declarations. 11 requests are in process, including California's September 14 request for a major disaster declaration for the record-breaking rainfall and flooding across California and other states brought by Tropical Storm Hillary. A common understanding of vocabulary is necessary between the cultural heritage and emergency management communities. So what is meant by cultural heritage? Our cultural heritage encompasses everything depicted here and much, much more. These cultural and historic resources are a link not only to our past, but also to the present and future. 
What do they all have in common? They're all vulnerable to damage from natural, technological, or human-caused disasters. Without quick intervention, they can be irreparably damaged or lost forever. Cultural and historic resources are held in the public trust by cultural heritage institutions that range from A to Z. These institutions hold the collective history of our communities, our states, our territories, our tribes, and our nation. They anchor us to our community identity. They educate us. They serve as gathering places for healing and spiritual renewal, and even cell phone charging. They're responsible for continuity of government. When disaster strikes a community, recovery of these very institutions is vital for the economic, social, artistic, religious, and civic life of that community. If these institutions don't recover, the community never fully recovers. PENTA is the public-private partnership sponsored by FEMA's Office of Environmental Planning and Historic Preservation, OEHP, and the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative, or SCRI. Together, we advocate for the protection of cultural heritage, and that protection includes helping cultural heritage organizations prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters. Hentes, Henta focuses on domestic disasters and emergencies, while SCRI's focus is international, and SCRI works very often with ECROM. HENTEF's website has extensive resources for the benefit of cultural institutions, arts organizations, historic property owners, and the general public. There are two of us in HENTEF at FEMA headquarters, and the two of us couldn't possibly fulfill HENTEF's mission by ourselves. So HENTEF amplifies its efforts through its members. We have 19 federal agencies that are shown here in red, including the Library of Congress and the National Archives and Records Administration, and important funding agencies such as the Small Business Administration and the National Endowment for the Humanities. NTEF's 43 private nonprofit national service organizations appear in black, and among them are the American Library Association, the International Association of Emergency Managers, and the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officer Officers. Together, these 62 entities represent expertise in the arts, culture, historic preservation, emergency management, and tribal affairs. HENTEF can leverage this network to help FEMA and our federal partners connect with and assist cultural institutions and arts organizations at the local and state level. When we're not in the midst of addressing a disaster, we train cultural stewards and emergency managers. In Heritage Emergency and Response Training, HART, we help cultural stewards better understand what emergency managers do when disaster strikes and help emergency managers better understand what cultural stewards do when disaster strikes. We train them how to work together to protect the irreplaceable objects that bring meaning and understanding to their community. We've just selected our 25 participants who will be coming to DC this December to take part in HEART 2024. HENTEF reviews FEMA policy and guidance and state and county emergency plans when asked uh, to ensure that cultural and historic resources are incorporated into planning and mitigation guidance. HENTEF did not create this particular guide, although I certainly wish I had we had, it was created by a FEMA Region 2 mitigation team that recognized the power of incorporating arts and culture into bricks and mortar mitigation projects. When disaster strikes, HENTEF coordinates the collection and sharing of information about cultural institutions and arts organizations that might have suffered damage. Listed here are the entities with whom HENTEF coordinates, especially following a disaster. They include HENTEF members, of course, along with FEMA's response and recovery leadership. Our stakeholders, the people we want to reach out to, run the gamut from state cultural agencies to volunteer cultural heritage emergency networks at the state or local level. When there's a notice event, such as a hurricane, 
I'll reach out to these entities with preparedness messaging. And if there's a no notice event, such as an earthquake, I'll reach out to these same entities um, for follow-up first for response and then for recovery. In collaboration with HENTEF members, we recently created three rapid damage assessment forms to help capture quickly damage that has occurred following an event. Um, we don't have the resources that ECRUM has. Wouldn't it be cool if we had this as a, as a mobile app, but we're not there yet. Uh, we have a form for cultural institutions with just the segment shown here. And we also have forms for arts organizations and one for individual artists and performing groups. We're grateful to the Foundation for Advancement and Conservation, FAIC, which is a HENTEF member, for hosting the data for cultural institutions. And we're grateful to the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response, NCAPER, also a HENTEF member, for hosting the data for arts organizations and artists and performing groups. Our hope is that this form can become the standard way to collect information in the United States, we're going to be tweaking it as they're employed following disasters, and we hope that we'll eventually be able to identify trends and unmet needs that we, cultural stewards and emergency managers, can then learn from and address. We conduct these and other response-related actions as a supporting organization of the National Response Framework under Emergency Support Function 11, agriculture and natural resources. Even though you don't see the word culture in the title, uh, except in the word agriculture, it's nestled in there. HENTEF works closely with an office of one of the primary agencies, the Department of the Interior, that is charged with protecting natural and cultural resources and historic properties, NCH. HENTEF is also a supporting organization of the natural and cultural resources recovery support function of the National Disaster Recovery Framework, so the NCR RSF of the NDRF. This is where HENTEF intersects with state and local recovery efforts. If this recovery support function is activated, and it isn't always, the Department of the Interior sends a field coordinator to support recovery efforts for both natural and cultural resources. I work closely with this field coordinator in the cultural resources space by identifying and sharing issues, impacts, and unmet needs of private nonprofit arts and culture organizations. And then we work together with support from HENTEF members to address these needs. Following a disaster, we draw on the diverse expertise of our members to deliver technical assistance, guidance, and resources. These photos were taken in the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria in 2017. They illustrate the technical assistance delivered by various federal partners. In the left and center photos, a conservator from the Smithsonian Institution in full PPE is evaluating the condition of damaged territorial records in the Virgin Islands for future treatment. And on the right, five federal agencies brought training in mold removal and health and safety to Puerto Rico's cultural stewards. Public assistance is the FEMA funding program that can be triggered by a major disaster declaration. It's a program that helps private nonprofits and government agencies get back on their feet. The public assistance program and policy guide that you see on the left is the reference for public assistance or PA. Papa G, as we fondly refer to this tone, includes references to the arts and culture community. Unfortunately, there are no sections in the current version devoted specifically to arts and culture organizations, which makes trying to get into public assistance a real challenge for private nonprofit organizations. I just learned that version five, which will be coming out next year, will have a separate chapter for private nonprofit organizations. So all the hard work we've been doing to rally for that change uh, finally is coming to pass. So when, not if, disaster strikes, those of you in the arts and culture sector may need to consider federal funding to help in your recovery. So I highly recommend 
that you become familiar with the public assistance process on blue sky days, days when you're not in the midst, in the throes of a disaster. And I don't know how long the new version is going to be, um, but certainly if you suffer from insomnia, this guide is 277 pages long and it can cure it immediately. This field guide in English and Spanish was published last year by NCAPER, the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response. It was created to help demystify federal disaster relief for the arts and culture sector. In other words, it translates FEMA ease into plain English by helping artists and arts organizations see what's available, understand clearly what isn't available, and decide if pursuing federal aid uh, navigating the process is quite a challenge, and it's not just FEMA public assistance, to decide whether pursuing federal aid is a good use of an organization's time. Uh, don't be misled by the title. It also applies to cultural institutions. When homes are impacted by disasters such as storms, flooding, hurricanes, and tornadoes, treasured and irreplaceable family heirlooms including photos, books, quilts, and other keepsakes become even more cherished. In support of FEMA's individual assistance program, Save Your Family Treasures specialists set up stations at disaster recovery centers to offer tips and demonstrate techniques on how to salvage family heirlooms and treasures after they've been damaged. We print out these double-sided fact sheets for distribution at disaster recovery centers Two are about salvaging cherished items from a water-based event, and the one on the left is about salvaging items following a fire, which we've shared uh, with Maui. These and other Save Your Family Treasures resources are all on FEMA.gov, so feel free to explore these resources and share them widely before, during, or after a disaster. And, Feel free to contact me whenever to help out or to answer questions. You don't have to wait for disaster to contact me. I'm Lori Foley of the Heritage Emergency National Task Force. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lori. Appreciate that awesome, awesome presentation. Yeah. Uh, any questions for Lori? Uh, you can use the Q&A function or type it in the chat. Okay, we have a raised hand. Aparna. Aparna. Yes. Thank you, Lori. That was such an informative uh, presentation. Uh, my question to you is, you mentioned that you have been, uh, you know, developed these uh, damage and risk assessment forms. So have you gathered, uh, like, have you had, like, any kind of an uh, example to share where you were able to gather data consistently um, in, in any area affected by an emergency and whether you were able to develop cost estimates based on that? And uh, because... uh, No, we developed these pretty much later in the hurricane season. So um, I know some some arts organizations responded to, uh, following Hurricane Idalia, Tropical Storm Idalia. Um, no, it was Hurricane Idalia, but we don't have data left. And we don't ask people for cost estimates at this point, because we've found in, certainly in Puerto Rico, that when we went, when we asked too many questions, people gave up answering because it was too hard to think about those kinds of answers. And the premise is that people will then be able to reach out to or or with this data collected or the answers submitted, the national heritage responders can follow up with a phone call and elicit more um, content and questions and move forward that way or in caper. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. No, because uh, from our farms, what we we do is that we have an analysis step, but that is not necessarily done by those who gather data, but it's done by experts who can then, based on the data, estimate costs and develop a bill of quantities. Yeah, so that just wanted yeah. to understand that. That's, no, that is great. That is great. That is beyond my area of expertise. <laughs> Thank you, but it was very informative. Thank you so much for your excellent Thank you, Aparna. Any other questions? Oh, Lee, Les, yes. 
Hi, thank you so much. That was a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, I was just wondering, would City of EMD be able to share your presentation? There's a lot of links. I was trying to take uh, screenshots as I could. Um, yes, but, absolutely. But there was a lot of great information there. I sent the, a PDF of the presentation to Callan and the hyperlinks work in the PDF. So perfect. Anybody thank you so much. Them. Yep, you're welcome. Hi, uh, Lori. Uh, just curious. You had mentioned that you would um, you would want the cultural institutions to submit their damage uh, to the city or to the county after a disaster uh, to meet those thresholds. But how does insurance play into it? If they have a lot of their artifacts insured, uh, would it still count? You know, I don't know whether how how picky FEMA is about getting to that estimate in terms of whether they're parsing out insurance or not, because I know oftentimes, because they want to get that declaration um, that um, declared ASAP, they do what are known as windshield surveys, and they'll just go through and someone will estimate the damage to a, to a structure. So of course, if there's um, a really urgent need, it might be a while before cultural institutions are even able to access their facility and be able to go in and, and do um, an assessment of that. But uh, a ballpark figure in terms of what their collections are valued at, um, and then maybe subtracting out what they have in covered insurance. I think it would require the local emergency manager working with that institution. Um, it could be a challenge too, because the local emergency manager is also dealing with infrastructure and everything else that's on their plate. I know it's gotten, you know, that that proposal has gotten mixed reactions from people who do preliminary damage assessments because they want it to be fast, quick and dirty and get that information. But sometimes a disaster declare a disaster isn't declared for months and you know that's because there's the the entity whether it's a county or a state is struggling to meet that threshold and that's really where cultural institutions can step up to plate and hopefully get it up over that top threshold. Thank you. Uh, Les, sounds like we're going to be giving you a call. <laughs> sounds good. All right. So Adam entered, Cal OES told me that the deductible would be taken into account for insurance. Thank you, Adam. All right, going, going. Oh, there's another question here. Where can we access the PDF? Uh, Callan, I'll let you say how you want that to happen. All right, uh, you know what? We will figure that out. Uh, Nancy, I will send that to you um, and I'll send it to Les. And if anybody wants access to, you can always email me directly and uh, we will send that over. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, Lori, thank you so much for attending. Uh, it was a pleasure, uh, great presentation. We're going to now move on uh, to our next presenter and then we'll take a break, a short five minute break after that. Um, so I want to uh, introduce our next presenters. They're going to be tag teaming this presentation. Uh, let me first make their co them co-hosts, one second. Okay, so our first um, first presenter is Beth Flowers. Uh, Beth Flowers has more than 30 years of executive level experience with nonprofits, governmental agencies, broadcast media, and the arts. She's a visionary thinker and a talented communicator. Beth has created messaging and strategies for victorious political candidates and issues, inspired citizen participation in government, managed public planning efforts, repositioned struggling organizations and developed innovative programming that connects people. Beth is a national leader in the fields of arts, professional development, community development, and entrepreneurship. As a creator of, and executive director of the AIR Collaborative, she is the forefront of connecting artists and creatives to their communities in new ways that truly raise the value of art and creativity. Cheryl Ross is a management analyst working for the City of Las Vegas Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Affairs Department. 
uh, with, and she's been working with them for 26 years. She's currently responsible for managing the department's contracts and grants and recently administered a $600,000 ARPA grant program and re-enabled, or sorry, re-granted this funding back into the arts community to support artists and arts organizations negatively impacted by the pandemic. She's also a member of the National Coalition of Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response, or NCAPER, uh, and she's a crisis analysis and mitigation coach. Um, she's trained to coach distressed communities in developing or expanding mitigation efforts using the arts and creativity. So we will hand it over to Beth and Cheryl. Awesome. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I'm hoping Cheryl can come on camera as well since we're going to tag team this together. Hi, Cheryl. It's Hello. nice to see you. We're, we're across the country from each other. I know that doesn't matter to um, the rest of you, but it matters to us. Um, so here we go. We're going to um, sort of uh, change the, the way, what we're talking about um, a little bit here, um, uh, because we're going to start talking about the much more grassroots side of culture, um, rather than talking about um, museums and institutions, we're gonna be talking about people. Um, and the AIR Collaborative has been doing work um, for the past 10 years that is all about helping people find common ground that vitalizes communities. And we really um, help diverse community members learn from each other, support each other, and put creative vision and business know-how to work and we believe some really important things that I hope um, matter to you as well. Creativity is what makes us human. It helps us find common ground. We've been talking about that um, in the last two speakers, talking about how important it is that we protect the culture and the creativity um, that tells the story of our community. But we also think that diverse voices and people strengthen communities and that in disasters, this is actually a really important piece of what sometimes gets missed. So when we're thinking about culture, it's not just the institutions that we're thinking about, it's the actual people um, who are in communities that really um, are important to the success. And what we've been doing um, is, is working on systemic change that has moved us into the emergency management field. So here's the problem. Um, we um, have been doing economic development based work um, for the past 10 years, but when COVID hit, we discovered, oh my gosh, the power of collaboration, helping people learn how to do things together and to move into action very quickly is actually pretty critical during an emergency. Now, we're not going to be talking about um, the first responder piece. Um, we really are for sure talking about recovery. And in fact, as Blue, as um, Lori mentioned, we're gonna be talking about the blue sky time because the work that we've been doing for the past two years across the country is really to help um, communities think about how they can actually prepare and um, mitigate their emergencies, particularly as they affect cultural institutions, but the culture itself of a community. So we don't need to tell you about what the problem is. We all know it. Um, we have a broader definition of um, disaster because we're not a government agency. We are not providing direct response. But what we are realizing is that this isn't just about um, natural disasters. It's also about human-made disasters. So some of the coaches that we've been working with and the communities that we've been working with are thinking about things like gentrification, um, and um, civil unrest. So that broader definition is still something that is clearly an emergency and requires that we learn how to be better together, um, which means we have to learn how to adapt quickly, be more human-centered, and really work to create resilient communities. So you've certainly heard about how things have been overlooked, we want you to think a little bit more broadly um, about what the creative sector is. So when you're thinking about the creative sector, it includes the unique people, businesses, history, places, and events that make your community special. And they, of course, help your community see hope and history, but they also have a role that they haven't been um, uh, tapped into as much as perhaps they can in the future, which is to really help communicate 
with the whole community and particularly under-resourced groups that they have relationships and um, trust with in a different way. So here's how we define the creative economy and that's who we're imagining that we're serving beyond cultural institutions. We're talking about whole sectors, um, which is why as we started talking at the beginning of the hour, um, that this really matters in, emer in an emergency because it's an important part of our economy. It includes advertising, fashion, film, music, video games, toys, the culinary arts. So food, making food, making craft beverages, um, publishing and the performing arts um, are all a part of the creative economy. It certainly also includes cultural heritage, which we've been talking about. So the actual institutions, um, our parks and trails, campuses and libraries, the, the physical places that may or may not be a for-profit business, they may be a nonprofit, um, but they all are feeding into the creative economy. And the reason that this matters so much during an emergency is because if you look at these numbers that are um, calculated every year by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, um, the big federal government here, creatives and culture, our sector is actually the number two sector in the country for our GDP. Only retail has a higher percentage as a sector of our GDP. So when you think about that, if we don't protect and make sure that we are helping the recovery um, of these organizations, these businesses, these institutions, it really has a big impact on our economy going forward. And um, as you heard from others, um, here's the bad news. The bad news is that there are zero dollars um, being allocated besides Lori's um, efforts for actual um, work related to the creative economy. And thank goodness for Lori Foley for advocating so powerfully and hard for so long to make sure that some of that is changing, not about the funding, but about whether we even count um, in the way that we're thinking about whether we can get uh, resources going forward. So here's the solution um, that we came up with with um, uh, the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response, NCAPER. You've heard that um, acronym before. Um, we work for NCAPER. What we've designed together um, is a program that is allowing communities across the country to have a coach. Um, Cheryl is one of those coaches. Um, and what she has been able to do um, is work with a network of folks who are arts professionals, but who are um, actually trained to do grassroots community work to help in preparedness and the mitigation work going forward. So this is a really unique project. We started piloting two years ago. We have um, 17 states um, now in our mix. Um, and this is all thanks to support from the Mellon Foundation and the Tremaine Foundation going forward. So we're excited about the ability to have a person in each state as we continue this work who the arts sector can call on, who has built relationships with the emergency, develop, uh, emergency management sector locally, um, who's participating in um, VOAD activities, um, uh, so that they really can help the sector quickly and really build long-term relationships that allow the recovery and the mitigation phases to be covered. So the work that we're trying to do is all about inspiring hope and empathy, that we have diverse community voices actually connected to emergency management and the arts sector together. Um, new leaders are starting to emerge in the communities where we're doing this work, and the communities are actually starting to feel differently prepared and embracing readiness. And the way that we do our process is just to gather people. Um, so this is sort of, we need those institutions so that we can gather in a place. Um, but what we do is pull together the arts folks, the emergency management people, and really start to learn together, and then most importantly, move into action together. And um, we have a process that we've been using um, in the states and communities where we're working. Our first step is just to engage, to start with that first meeting of having folks spend a couple of hours together, learn each other's language, 
um, and start to discover that that we need each other and that there are ways that we can think about how we can respond and recover um, and learn to actually mitigate our disasters as they come down the pike. Um, and the second step is that we actually help that networks really start to develop. So having ongoing meetings and really making sure that the art sector is connected more deeply with emergency management and with VOAD activities that may be happening locally. But the final step um, is an actual workshop that is a community led workshop uh, to do mitigation projects that are very small scale. And so our CAM coaches um, are actually trained to help small teams work on creating mitigation projects that will help their community, their neighborhood, um, uh, actually do better when uh, the next disaster happens. So this is just a little brief overview of the Engage workshop. Um, which is that two hour workshop. And we do some exercises that Cheryl's gonna tell you about. Thank you, Beth, I appreciate that. So like Beth said, to gauge creative community readiness, uh, we would start with an engaged workshop. And the purpose of the workshop is to build deep relationships and trust between emergency management and the arts and creative sectors to build stronger, more resilient, ready communities that serve you well. Uh, some of our objectives through these workshops is to create a local network that includes both local emergency management and creative sectors. Two, to build and strengthen grass, grassroots community awareness of and participate in emergency management cycles and systems. And three, to develop and expand community-led preparedness and mitigation projects using the arts and creativity. So during this engaged workshop, we to get some participation and get everybody uh, going, we ask a bunch of questions and we use a, a whiteboard. And one of the questions is we ask is how do the arts help in a crisis? Uh, how do the arts and creative sector provide valuable value beyond economic measures? And the goal is really to be better collaborators. So through these exercises, we meet with the group for 10 minutes, quick introductions uh, and how they identify as a creative emergency management professional both or other uh, and then we advocate for others we divide into two groups we divide into emergency management or creatives each group lists why the community needs the group least like themselves and then they share what they share with the other group uh, part two is we acknowledge uh, the challenges each group reflects on what makes it hard to work with you or your sector. When I say you, it could be creatives or emergency management folks. And part three, we, we are better together. So then the groups advocate for funding for both emergency management and creative sectors together because the community gains more. And then they share their pitch with each other. So, uh, then, go ahead. so you get the idea that we're really getting into um, community development work here that is bringing the, um, the emergency management work and the creative sector deep into the community. Um, the second step is then the shift workshop. And Cheryl, I don't know if your camera um, fell off, but your camera is off. Um, <laughs> there we go, she's back. She's turning uh, off, I don't know why. <laughs> Um, so um, the next um, piece that we do with the community is actually um, a mitigation workshop that is um, really designed to reduce future disaster impacts. So it includes um, planning and implementing during blue sky time. So this is during, it's after slash in the end of recovery and moving into that mitigation. Um, projects are focused on better serving people or communities who didn't get help. And of course, projects can involve infrastructure investments, but they're not limited to that. So often there are other projects that may not be about sewers um, that are important for us to actually make sure that people are served better in the next um, disaster. So what we have the teams who come together for this workshop do is they work on designing a project together that addresses a local preparedness or mitigation issue it has to include people who don't work or play together. It has a one year timeline and it's small. It's $25,000 budget or less. So it can happen with who and what you have already, 
but it may lead to bigger projects. Um, so the purpose here is to really get the community engaged and valuing the power of mitigation work so that they actually are more likely to be engaged and accessible and be able to access service when a disaster strikes. Here are the kinds of things um, that, um, that have come out of and will continue to come out of the workshops that we're doing festivals and community gathering, cultural asset mapping, cultural awareness and celebration. Um, during COVID, retail and restaurant remedies were a big part of how um, we all recovered. Um, Pop-up concerts, marketing campaigns, and of course there's always infrastructure, there's always sewers and sidewalks and trails, but the topics that um, communities are choosing to work on um, have been COVID-19 response or preparing for the next one, natural disasters, preparedness in general, and of course um, normal things like, or um, very clear things like historic and cultural preservation. But social issues, um, food security, um, and health and mental health are all things that have come up. So here's an example of an infrastructure project um, that was actually um, not a part of our work, but is a great example of, of a, um, an infrastructure project for mitigation that was um, that, that used mitigation dollars um, right in Denver, Colorado. It's a skate park that is a gathering place it is also stormwater infrastructure. So it has multiple purposes and it has that creative side that allows the um, infrastructure change that is helping mitigate flooding um, to actually have a, a public purpose as well. So what we did um, in the last couple of years was pilot these projects. And here are um, some of the workshops that we did in DC, Maryland and Virginia, the DMV. Um, last February, they wanted to focus their projects on how do we mitigate the next healthcare emergency. So they, um, the teams worked um, on uh, uncovering the problems they saw, and then they designed a pilot demonstration project that can be replicated. So um, one of the teams actually was addressing trust issues. This was something that came up for them in Baltimore City. Um, which was really about the fact that people were not feeling comfortable with emergency management agencies. And so their solution, which was again for their neighborhood, was to have a street fair that served a Baltimore distressed neighborhood. It included the arts, it included local music, art and food, but most importantly, emergency management folks and social service agencies were there so that you put a person and some free swag um, into people's minds. Um, and because we had both Maryland State um, emergency management folks and community and arts folks in the room, these projects were actually able to move forward. So they've piloted doing um, a street fair um, and seeing how that works. Um, same thing with a, another team in the DMV Metro. Um, they were interested in food insecurity. They saw how hard it was to get school lunches to kids um, when the schools were all closed. And same thing, um, really being a struggle for the elderly population. So the neighborhood that they were focused on had both an elementary school and also an assisted living um, facility as well. So they decided to design a community garden um, that again, this is not rocket science, but it is mitigation of a problem that is being community led. So it was small scale, um, which again, meant that we had people engaged who are continuing to meet um, and finding space because they had everybody engaged in the process, they were able to move quickly into action. And I'm gonna let Cheryl talk about what we did in Homa, Louisiana. Um, Cheryl was um, in Homa with me for this one. Um, and their goal was really to deal with Hurricane Ida. Thank you, Beth. Uh, yes, I got to actually attend the shift workshop uh, this year with uh, three other fellow CAM coaches. And while uh, their initial goal was to mitigate coastal erosion and climate change, um, organically, the groups worked together uh, and they identified problems that were uncovered by Hurricane Ida. Uh, both teams designed a pilot and demonstrated projects that can be replicated. Um, and so when we broke up into two teams uh, and after like discussion, it was really awesome 
when we all when we came together that both teams their their goal was to mitigate the communication issues that they experienced during Hurricane Ida. Um, and the first group decided to utilize their existing radio station, um, their existing high voltage radio station, uh, and it was designated for an official emergency updates during disasters where they could have local DJs, ministers, and music provided throughout this um, radio station uh, to provide hope, uh, to provide any type of critical information, uh, churches organized volunteer efforts to collect names and needs for all residents in the parish. And then we were also, through community events, going to kind of give away some free swag. And that would be in the, the in crank radios to uh, incentivize the sharing of data. And just to pop in on that one, what was really essential is that we had parish emergency management and planning um, officials who were a part of the workshop. So when we had ministers saying, we know no one trusts um, the government, uh, we're not going to tell you where we live. And that was one of the problems was making sure that we knew where people were um, after Ida in order to help get them food, clothing, shelter, et cetera. Um, this was a really important piece was um, making sure that trusted people in the community were able to help with that communication gap. Um, and here's the second project. And so in the second project, again, communication uh, was key. And in this group, we actually had um, a Nevada Arts Council, the a head, of a Nevada, the, uh, ne head of a Nevada Arts Council. We had an artist in our group. Uh, we had a commissioner, a city commissioner. Um, and so what we decided to do, or we, I like how I put myself in that group. Uh, they came up with a prototype of a 15 foot tall Cat 5. It's a safe metal tree sculpture for one of the Bayou communities in Terrebonne, in the Terrebonne Parish. This would act as a meeting place, a charging station, a generator and direct power supply. Uh, it also could act as a loudspeaker with different types of lights. And we talked about, you know, having like uh, it do yellow for caution, you know, red meaning it was good. And then red, obviously, that we're in the middle of a disaster. Uh, it could be a designated supply distribution center for food, water, diapers. Uh, and also, um, we, would, we were going to do a fundraiser that included leaf tiles and the families could fill out, could do a, a tile with family names, and we could lay that around the uh, the tree, and that would be another way we could in, we could include the community in this. Um, what was amazing because of the grassroots nature of this, and because there were mitigation dollars already in place, um, both of these projects were able to move forward really quickly. And um, because again, we had officials and community members planning this together, um, the buy-in what happened much faster um, than one would imagine. Um, what was really awesome too is because of the relationships, um, it was easy for them to quickly talk with the power company to make sure that um, the place where they knew they were going to be doing designated supply distribution, um, that they could actually cut a deal, um, you know, quickly for making sure that there was generator backup um, in an appropriate way for this particular spot. So once again, it's a three-step process that we're using, um, that communities are using to keep moving forward. We start with that two-hour engage, then we gather and sort of build the network itself and then move directly into action. Um, so the project that we're working on now, along with our CAM coaches, um, is really taking this methodology a little bit deeper. We're now doing a pilot with the city of St. Louis um, with their um, emergency management commissioner's office and their planning and urban design department um, that is designed. The goal of the project is to actually increase emergency management and planning agency budgets to include staff who are only serving the creative sector and under-resourced cultures and communities. 
so that they really designate um, and, and budget for this activity. And the work is this, it's going to um, take place over the next 18 months, but the discovery that we're doing by doing these workshops and really digging in is to talk about climate migration. It's already happening, as we all know, within our country. So this um, St. Louis project is focusing um, on what would it be like um, if St. Louis is a place where people need to move, how do we protect the culture who is that is here? How do we um, enhance and make sure that we protect new cultures coming in? And how do we help them learn to work together in, in um, ways to, to, um, to live together harmoniously as this unfolds? We're doing this work with the state of Louisiana um, and also some um, Mississippi River communities along the way to really talk about how climate migration can be mitigated going forward. And we're done. <laughs> All right. Any questions for Cheryl or Beth? Okay. Uh, well, um, if there's any questions, uh, you can always email me. Um, also, I believe, uh, did you share your emails already, Beth, Cheryl? I'll share them. Okay, great. Uh, and they'll put it in the chat. And I just want to thank you both for, for uh, your uh, excellent presentation. Um, I think it represents, um, like you said, uh, a whole other way of thinking about um, cultural resources and um, I found it very informational. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and take a five minute break. <clears throat> so we'll start get up again at uh, 2.32 and um, we'll introduce our next presenter there.
So it is 2.33. Um, let's go ahead and get started. I want to introduce our next speaker. And it's going to be Ken Bernstein from our City Planning Office of Historic Resources. Ken Bernstein is a principal city planner for the Los Angeles Department of City Planning. In this capacity, he serves as manager of the city's Office of Historic Resources, where he directs Los Angeles's historic preservation policies. He serves as lead staff member for the city's Cultural Heritage Commission, has overseen the completion of Survey LA, a multi-year uh, citywide survey of historic resources with significant support from the J. Paul Getty Trust, and has led the creation of a comprehensive historic preservation program for Los Angeles. He's also currently overseeing the department's urban design studio and has previously directed other policy planning initiatives, including work on community plan updates, housing policy, and transportation planning. He previously served for eight years as director of preservation issues for the Los Angeles Conservancy, the largest local nonprofit uh, historical preservation organization in the country, where he directed the con Conservancy's public policy and ad advocacy activities. He also served as planning and transportation deputy to Los Angeles City Council member Laura Chick and as editor of the planning report, a monthly publication of urban planning, housing, and transportation issues in Southern California. Ken is currently an adjunct professor in urban planning for the USC Pride, uh, USC Price School of Public Policy and serves as a senior fellow for UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs. And Ken, I'm going to uh, hand it over to you. Let me just make sure you have. Hey, thanks. Can you can you hear me? I can't seem to start my video. I don't know if you can enable that so I can be seen or. Yeah, give me one second, Ken. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, is it working now? Almost there. Okay. Okay, you should be able to now. Let me try it again. Sorry. So, oops. Oh, no, let's see. That's strange. Hold on, give me one moment. Okay. Uh, Okay, there I am. So, all right. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, great to be with all of you um, uh, this afternoon. So, um, let's see here. Here we go. Um, so, now you've had a chance to hear about uh, the uh, emergency response at the federal level, about mitigation, about a number of other topics. I'm going to bring it 
um, specifically to the city of Los Angeles and our work in Los Angeles city planning, specifically on historic and cultural resources. And to give a bit of an overview, very, very quick uh, overview on the different types of uh, historic and cultural resources within the city of Los Angeles, the steps that we've taken to take uh, comprehensive stock of those resources, um, where that information is available, and then uh, how that can be used in um, the case of a disaster or uh, emergency in the city. And I really welcome um, your questions as well, because this is just kind of scratching the surface on a very large and complex topic, but uh, I know time is limited. So um, let's see here. Here we go. Okay, so let me start then with um, uh, kind of the first category of our historic and cultural resources in Los Angeles, which are our um, city landmarks, or what we call in, in the city of LA, historic cultural monuments, which are our individually designated historic resources. Our uh, staff that I lead, the Office of Historic Resources in Los Angeles City Planning, serves as the professional staff to the city commission that designates our historic cultural monuments. It's the five-member um, Cultural Heritage Commission, not to be confused with the Cultural Affairs Commission that is in our Department of Cultural Affairs and oversees arts and cultural uh, policy work in the city. The Cultural Heritage Commission is really dealing with historic and cultural resources. Um, and uh, it used to be part of the Department of Cultural Affairs and that function came over to planning back in 2006 as we created the uh, Office of Historic Resources in Planning. And today we have over uh, 1,200, now nearing almost 1,300 historic uh, cultural monuments. Our program for designation of these local landmarks goes all the way back to 1962. We have one of the earliest uh, historic preservation ordinances designating local landmarks of any major city in the country, which is something that surprises all those uh, folks and or naysayers about Los Angeles who think we are not a city that has history, architecture, culture. Um, in fact, we, we have been a preservation pioneer in terms of our local preservation law. So now almost 1300 monuments. Some of these of course are very iconic. Um, the Hollywood sign, our LAX theme building, uh, the lower left are great uh, movie palaces of Los Angeles, such as the Los Angeles Theater on Broadway and the dozen great uh, movie palaces that we have just on that one corridor. Eastern Columbia building is an ex excellent example of Art Deco architecture, but many other historic cultural monuments are more modest. Um, some, you know, in fact, probably a majority are uh, residences and single family homes that have architectural significance or significance because they are associated with important individuals or trends and themes in the history and evolution of the city. So it's important to, uh, for, you know, again, first understand that we do have these individual historic resources designated as historic cultural monuments. But a second category, in addition to that, and actually a category that represents many more individual historic, many more his total historic resources across the city are uh, the city's historic preservation overlay zones, or what we, uh, uh, the acronym is HPOZs more generally known across the country as historic districts. So these are locally designated historic neighborhoods that uh, you know, are cohesive neighborhoods reflecting a historic architectural style or a grouping of historic styles, or may reflect, again, significant social or cultural history in a community. Our office uh, oversees uh, these neighborhoods and we have 35 HPOZs across the city that are um, visible on the maps here. The majority of them are within a several mile radius of downtown Los Angeles, but we do have some of our HPOZs in really every corner of the city, uh, or most at least. They, they're now in, I think, 13 of the 15 council districts, all the way from the northern tip of the San Fernando Valley in Granada Hills, the Balboa Highlands neighborhood, post-World War II neighborhood, down to the almost the tip of the, the su southern end of the city in San Pedro with the Vinegar Hill neighborhood, uh, near the port area of the city. Um, and the HPOZs uh, are involved with conducting design reviews of exteriors uh, uh, to those structures. There's no interior review that takes place. So property owners are free to alter their uh, interiors, remodel a kitchen or a bathroom, et cetera, without HPOZ review. Uh, but this is the list of our um, HPOZs across the city. And many of you who are, uh, who are local, 
will um, you know, recognize many of these neighborhoods and it really reflects a great um, diversity within uh, each HPOZ and among the various HPOZs in terms of the, the time periods they represent of our history and culture, um, different architectural styles. And just to give you a quick sense of that diversity, this is a view of uh, a block in the Jefferson Park uh, HPOZ, a neighborhood of craftsmen bungalows primarily from the early 20th century uh, and uh, a very um, a cohesive neighborhood architecturally, a very diverse neighborhood, both ethnically and socioeconomically. Um, and as well as here, this, this image kind of shows that you can insert drought tolerant landscaping within the setting of a historic district. Another uh, neighborhood northeast of downtown LA, the Lincoln Heights HPOZ, um, and uh, this image kind of reflects the fact that you know many of our HPOZs have a range of densities as well. And in this image, a single family home, a three unit uh, you know, triplex in the middle, and then a multifamily building, different architectural styles, uh, but all uh, historic styles in the neighborhood and it hangs together within a historic district. So um, we have these tw about 21,000 properties that are a part of these 35 HPOZs. And it's a huge number that uh, if there ever were an emergency or disaster, we'd have to take comprehensive stock of uh, potential impacts in those neighborhoods. And while it is a huge number, that's still, that only represents a little under two and a half percent of the overall parcels in the city, where it's about 880,000 total properties or individual parcels in Los Angeles. So we have a large number of historic resources, but it is still a small percentage of um, uh, our entire built environment in the city. In addition to local designation though, our office administers uh, reviews of permits that affect properties that are designated, uh, listed in the National Register of Historic Places, as well as the California Register of Historical Resources, the state's list of historic resources. And there are many, um, both individual resources, as well as districts. I've shown here a couple of historic districts uh, included in the National Register, again, coming back to Broadway as a historic theater and commercial district, uh, Broadway between um, Second and Olympic, and then the Beverly Fairfax National Register District, more recently designated, um, a, a great deal of kind of small scale multifamily housing, uh, apart, small apartments, duplexes, um, and, uh, and other units designated for their architecture, uh, Spanish colonial revival and related styles from the 1930s and 40s, but also as a significant enclave uh, for the Jewish community in the city, particularly um, during the mid-century period in Los Angeles. It was designated both for its architectural and cultural significance in the National Register. So the California Register also, it's important to point out, includes properties that have been formally determined eligible for the National Register through various federal processes uh, and determinations. And so um, those properties are thereby listed as well in the California Register. The information on all of our designated historic resources that I've mentioned, the Historic Cultural Monuments, the HPOZs, National and California Register, um, that information has traditionally been available on our planning department geographic information system called ZEMIS, the Zone Information and Map Access System. And you can search any parcel, any property in the city on ZEMIS and pull up comprehensive zoning information, uh, all the land use regulations and many other uh, information from many other city departments as well in terms of uh, uh, factors that might affect development rights uh, and uh, kind of planning and zoning considerations uh, related to those properties. And then um, this historic preservation review, yes, uh, that is hyperlinked here, uh, indicates that it comes up as a yes, it is a designated historic resource at some level, and you can click that hyperlink, and a pop-up comes up to give you more information on its actual historic designation. But on top of what's already designated, uh, our office led a multi-year um, effort to uh, comprehensively survey historic and cultural resources in the city. And this was a about a decade-long partnership with the Getty, J. Paul Getty Trust with both financial support from the Getty Foundation and technical advisory, and advisory support from the Getty Conservation Institute, which works internationally on heritage conservation issues. And our office managed this project. It was the first real attempt to 
comprehensively identify our historic and cultural resources, the largest survey of its kind completed in the US by any municipality. Um, and it's a project that's gotten quite a bit of attention nationally in the heritage conservation field. And the uh, intent of the survey was to provide baseline information for multiple purposes. Some of it is really to guide good planning that uh, to plan the future of the city and how our communities are going to grow and evolve, we need to know what and where our historic resources are. So we know what areas we want to conserve and help protect from uh, rapid change or demolitions or greater uh, density perhaps, and what areas we can accommodate greater change and uh, you know, focus some of our growth and, and future density, often near some of our transit stops uh, as our planning policies reinforce. Um, and we need to know where uh, historic resources might be affected in the process and to create greater certainty for project applicants and property owners so they're not unintentionally impacting historic resources or investing in properties with an intent to redevelop only to find there's great historic significance. So this is all uh, wanting to create all this information in one place and always, at least in the back of our minds and the forefront of our minds and in this uh, webinar, is how this information also can be used um, to inform our uh, emergency and disaster planning, uh, both uh, before there is an, an, an occurrence, so we know this information is available, and how this can guide us to make better decisions after uh, there is some type of uh, uh, disaster or after an emergency passes. This information from Survey LA is all now available in a comprehensive inventory of historic resources called Historic Places LA, which represents kind of the marriage between the survey, the collection of all of this data, and a system that the Getty Conservation Institute created internationally to manage heritage information called ARCHES. It's an, it's an open source system that they are using uh, across the globe and many uh, communities are adopting. And this was the first customization of that ARCHES system for a, a major municipality. Um, and we have launched Historic Places LA, of which a new version is going to be launching during the month of November. And we're very excited about that. These are some screenshots of the existing homepage um, showing here the Griffith Observatory and some of our featured searches for historic resources. It's at historicplacesla.org. And you can search a geography. There's a map view function where you can um, zoom in on an area of the city and pull up all of the both designated and uh, surveyed uh, through Survey LA historic resources in any community. And each of those pinpoints represents, uh, uh, you know, a, a sur more of them are surveyed than are designated, but some of both. It represents a, either a designated or a potential historic resource. In a particular community, you can pull up a, a much more detailed resource report on Historic Places LA. So um, just to kind of uh, you know, give you the, the complete lay of the land, then we have the, this, these categories of designated historic resources that I've mentioned, both local, LA Historic Cultural Monuments, Historic Preservation Overlay Zones, National and California Register, and then everything that we've identified in some of our surveys that includes Survey LA, as I mentioned, there were some past surveys back when uh, we had, and I won't get into all the details on this, redevelopment areas overseen by our former community redevelopment agency that was phased out with changes in state law over a decade ago. But those surveys also provide valuable information on historic resources. Those are now in Historic Places LA as we launch our new version. And then as well, uh, a great deal of work that we've done on historic context, historic preservation frameworks um, that have guided a lot of this survey work and that have been, a, and we've developed specialized frameworks associated with many of the diverse ethnic and cultural communities of the city, um, including um, an African-American historic context, a Latino Los Angeles context, the nation's first LGBT historic context, this data from th that historic context, these frameworks that we've created is also now going to be available in Historic Places LA. So in all, this is really an invaluable resource with um, uh, yeah, in this inventory about 57,000 plus uh, individual sites, uh, either designated or surveyed potential historic resources, about 1100 historic districts in the city, and then a large number, tens of thousands of information records overall and uh, associations with persons or groups. Um, and so this is really an invaluable source of information 
both in uh, advanced planning, preparedness, as I said, for long range planning, community planning, disaster preparedness, um, all the work um, of um, uh, you know, the emergency management department and other city agencies um, to prepare Los Angeles for the future as we wanna understand again, where are significant, uh, you know, what they are and where our significant historic cultural resources are in the city. So with that, um, there's my contact information. I'm happy to uh, wrap up and take any questions you may have. All right, any questions for Ken? You can uh, type a Q&A or type in the chat. All right. Well, thank you again, Ken, for attending. Um, it, it was very informational. Um, I think we all got a lot out of it. So um, really appreciate you being on, sir. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. All right. <clears throat> so now we will move on to our next presenter. And let me make sure I give you co-host before. OK. So our next presenter is Les Borse from uh, the J. Paul Getty Trust. Uh, Les Borse is the Emergency Planning Specialist for the J. Paul Getty Trust Security and Visitor Services Department. He handles the emergency preparedness and business continuity planning for the Getty Center and the Getty Villa. He has been with the Getty since 2000 and involved in emergency preparedness for the trust since 2014. He sees emergency preparedness as an ever evolving challenge that goes beyond structural planning uh, but the training of staff for their own preparedness, not only in the workplace, but in their homes. When not working, Les enjoys cycling, triathlon, and time with his wife and daughter. Les has accomplished many things during his career in emergency management. One of the greatest, of course, was being hired by the Getty Trust over 22 years ago. Another significant and even more relevant to BICEP was being elected as the president of BICEP for four consecutive years, from 1999 to 2022. Um, his leadership has resulted in more stability, additional creative programs, and the foundation of uh, sustained growth. So now I will hand it over to Les. Th thank you. I, I I'm sorry. I I, I sent you uh, more information than you needed. You could you probably should have stopped it. Uh, worked at the Getty for since 2000 <laughs> because it makes me feel very old. Um, I uh, am I paused? Can you hear me? We can hear you, Les. Okay, good. All right. I was getting a little trouble when I was pulling this up. Uh, thank you so much, Ken, uh, for pointing out the Getty Conservation Institute. Uh, when people come up to the Getty Center, they know the museum, they know the irises, they don't realize the amazing work uh, that the people in the building that I'm actually in right now, the Conservation Institute, do not just around the world, but I'm so proud of all the stuff that uh, they do and they partner with uh, right here in Los Angeles. I am the emergency planning specialist uh, for the J. Paul Getty Trust. I am, uh, as, as he also mentioned, a member of uh, a BICEP. It's an emergency planning and preparedness for, uh, group here in Los Angeles. That's why that additional part of the uh, in there that I sent him by mistake uh, was in there. Uh, but I'm going to basically talk a little bit more kind of a, on a granular uh, what a local cultural institution within Los Angeles is doing. We've certainly heard uh, internationally, uh, state, local, et cetera. And now I'm going to kind of go into kind of what we do here at the Getty, what I do and uh, uh, working within uh, our our group uh, as well. Um, there we go. Uh, Aparna at the beginning, uh, was perfect, was talking about how important it is to have risk assessment and kind of being able to do some mapping. Uh, I actually use this when I'm talking to groups about why do we even have an emergency planning specialist at the J. Paul Getty Trust. This is the FEMA risk uh, map. Uh, so you can see all the places around here and what's that level of risk according to FEMA. And you can see right there, there's Los Angeles and we're the reddest of the red. We are number one within the United States for, well, for, for most disasters, the only ones we really don't get, uh, well, used to say we didn't get hurricanes, uh, now we get hurricanes. Uh, we don't get volcanoes, and generally we do not get uh, major cold, but uh, uh, I was going to say this morning felt, you know, cold to me, so it just shows that my blood level is a little thin living out here in Los Angeles. Also, just a kind of a reminder of kind of some of the things that we've dealt with as a community, uh, not and as well as things that specifically the Getty has dealt with. 
this was, uh, we have fires. This was uh, prior to the opening of the Getty Center. It's still under construction there at the top left. That was at our Malibu, I'm sorry, it's Pacific Palisades location. We are in the city of Los Angeles at the villa as well. Uh, and that was the fire down in that area in 1993. Did get close, but didn't directly affect the villa operations. 1994, obviously, um, those of you who are old enough, like me, remember the uh, Northbridge earthquake. Uh, the Getty Center was still under construction at the time. Uh, this was our research institute, which was located in Santa Monica. And you can kind of see a lot of the damage that was suffered within that art library there. Uh, then the uh, GRI, uh, the Research Institute, five years later, after the uh, opening of the Getty Center in 1997, we experienced a large flooding. Uh, now, I, I know what you're thinking. We're way at the top of the hill. How do we get any flooding? This was actually some uh, broken pipes, burst pipes, and we did have some damage. We were able to protect most of our, our uh, collections within the Research Institute. Uh, one art piece uh, that was a mound of dirt uh, did it get destroyed. Uh, depending on who you ask, it was not a major uh, problem. Uh, because not a lot of people love the love the piece. Uh, we are being reported shoot. I should have said that out loud. Um, uh, we also have had some major fires within our area. Uh, one of the earliest ones was back in 2009. It was not a, a major fire. They didn't even name it, uh, but it was on our property. It was on our property while we were open. So we had to uh, get about, uh, about 2,000 uh, visitors and about 1,000 staff off-site through our back entrance, which is not made to pull that many people off site. Uh, we've also had the uh, Skirball fire, which is in the top right. And then of course, uh, you know you're not somebody until you have a fire named after you. That's our Getty fire right down there, 2016, which was four years ago, just a couple, uh, just a few days ago. So uh, something that we were thinking about. And we're very lucky here at the Getty. I, it, it's hard when I talk about this and say, oh, you should follow what we do. Uh, we have the resources and not only that, we uh, our leadership has had the vision uh, and the desire to make sure that we're as safe as possible. People have asked when we've had disasters when we've suffered through problems. Uh, and, and again, this is an area that has natural disasters. Um, you know, where are you gonna move the art and all that? Uh, instead, what they did is they worked with the architect to make sure that we are, uh, the art is fine where it's at, that we shelter the art in place. Uh, and you can see some of these things here to kind of protect us, including our million gallons of water. Uh, that's there specifically for fire suppression. We have a large number of landscape sprinklers. So uh, the morning, for example, of the Getty fire, we knew which area it was at. It was started just north of our property. We contacted our grounds manager over the phone and he, on his cell phone, uh, started turning on the sprinkler systems in the area closest to the fire to to reduce uh, uh, the spread of the sparks. Uh, you know, it's not gonna stop a fire, but hopefully the embers that are floating in that area, hopefully that bit of moisture will slow it down. It was really hard that day because we had extremely low uh, humidity in the area and it was so dry, if you remember. Uh, we have great fire systems throughout. This place was really, really well built. The villa uh, was redone, oh gosh, about 18 years ago uh, was when that was reopened after reconstruction. That also has a great system. Uh, we have a pre-action system. Our, uh, for those of you in the cultural institutions, uh, museums and libraries, we have a water suppression system. It is not a gas suppression system. Uh, part of that was uh, LAFD said, you could have gas, but you're going to need water as well. Uh, so we just did gas. Um, and uh, we that's also pull, can pull from our million gallons of water that's within uh, the locations. But it's a wet, it's a dry pipe system. Uh, and it takes two activations on our fire system before it'll even fill with water to reduce the chances of, uh, you know, breakage in the pipe that's going to leak down on it. Um, we have an uh, emergency operations center. This was the morning of the Getty fire. This was the Getty leadership, uh, as well as our facilities and our security department. We do have a, a, an EOC because we're a big enough location with two locations uh, that we've, we've had a number of emergencies. So we've operated out of this uh, a number of times. We, we do practice with it. Um, and as you can see, this was uh, all hands on deck sort of uh, training. Uh, since COVID, uh, we've started uh, teaching people to kind of uh, stay at home and, and do this over Zoom. However, it is something that we do have uh, to kind of like allow leadership and, and the, uh, the, the trust departments, as we call them, facilities, security, communications, uh, digital, 
to be able to help respond to, to the uh, emergency. And as needed, we call in the people within our collections department, whether it's the Research Institute or our museum folks. Uh, we do have to have drills all the time. The, one of the most important things is that uh, we have a large security department, but uh, I'm, you know, Ken was talking about the Conservation Institute. So we don't just have a museum. We, we have uh, offices and labs that are part of the Conservation Institute. Uh, a number of people work in there. Uh, we have the foundation, which is the uh, a grant giving arm of the Getty. We, you know, they have a whole floor of one of our buildings. A number of people work there. We have a giant research library. Uh, we have uh, a number of trust offices uh, that also work there, as well as our curators, our conservators, our preps, uh, registrars, all the different people that, that make up the museum portion of it. So we Without the visitors, we probably could have 900 plus people on site, uh, probably a little bit less with hybrid work. It's probably closer to about 700 on, any, on a given day. Uh, but if we have a, a full, uh, if we're open and we have a disaster that we have to respond to, we have to do evacuation, we have to focus on our visitors. So we do try to train uh, all of our staff, making sure they know what to do in case of a disaster so that our security can initially focus on our visitors then start focusing on the staff. And I can't, I can't emphasize enough in, in your location is, is engaging the staff in uh, not only preparedness, but uh, um, you know, how, do we, how are we gonna respond? How can we work together to kind of make sure that first of all, everybody's safe, which is the number one thing, and then start worrying about kind of uh, our location and then of course the collections. Uh, and this includes our tram, we're, we're so lucky we have such a, a lovely fun uh, uh, tram. Uh, it is considered a railroad by the state of California. Uh, so yay, we, we're a railroad. Uh, but it does mean that we have to, uh, and it's a good thing, annually do a full evac. Uh, uh, it's an offloading or an evacuation drill. So in case there is a problem on the tram, we can safely evacuate. Uh, so actually, we're going to be doing again this week, uh, this coming week on Monday. Uh, and so you can see exactly how we run through that in the bottom right photos. We have a ton of emergency supplies. Now, again, we have a lot of resources, but we also have a huge uh, location with a large number of people. So it, it's a, uh, um, you know, so we have to scale up to, to make sure that all those people can be taken care of. And these are basic stuff. I mean, everybody kind of has a first aid kit at their place. Uh, everybody should have uh, fire extinguishers. We have uh, at the Getty Center alone, we have about a thousand fire extinguishers, which is uh, when we have to do the the, the annual check is uh, I, I literally have dreams of, of fire extinguishing for about three weeks while we're doing that. Um, we have first aid rooms at both locations with some beds to allow people to lie down. Uh, we have trauma kits. It's unfortunately the world we're in. Uh, we not only have trauma kits, but we have to do training about that. Uh, we have AEDs and we train uh, all of our security staff are trained on that. But we're also reaching out, training our, our non-security staff on first aid CPR and AEDs. And again, because we're a large location, uh, we don't, you know, sometimes security could be three to five minutes away on foot. Uh, and so having people trained to be able to provide basic first aid until we can get there could be life-saving. Uh, here's a picture of our COVID tent back during COVID. So we kind of roll with whatever the latest thing is. And, and uh, Narcan, this is actually something we just started carrying now that it's over the counter. Uh, we've been very, very lucky that we've not had any uh, opioid overdoses on our sites, but this is the world today. This is what we have to do. Uh, I think Alma is right. You, you look out there, what are the potential hazards? What are the potential disasters? And, and how can we be prepared for those? Um, uh, some other things that we have, these are a little bit more collections related, uh, humidifiers, dehumidifiers, uh, ladders. We have ladders everywhere, but in particular, the, this ladder is pre-staged in uh, some of our vaults in the Research Institute. And so they have these very high bookshelves uh, with earthquake bars, mind you, we, we're, we are careful for that. But for the fear, I showed you the picture of the flooding within the Research Institute. Uh, we have a large number of plastic sheeting. You see plastic sheeting on that card in the top right, uh, already pre-staged on the top of those bookshelves. So we know that it's a possibility that there could be uh, water from above that could affect our collections down below. So we have them pre-staged and we have ladders up there. So if need be, we can send our securities officers uh, or our facility staff up those ladders to unroll that plastic sheeting, cover up and protect uh, the collections until we can get people on site to start getting them out of there. Uh, a wet dry vac that is uh, so huge to have. These are great 55 gallon 
Uh, you can't fill it up 55 gallons or that thing's not going to move again. Uh, you only have to fill it up about a third and uh, empty it and then keep bringing it back. But they're very, very effective when you have a little bit of flooding. And of course, having pads, snakes, uh, a number of different things. Again, flooding is a real problem. Uh, I'm I'm excited. To, uh, I hope I get invited to listen in on the uh, the atmospheric river uh, talk because that's something we at the Getty are starting to talk a lot about uh, right now. Uh, this is a crash cart, um, basically a repurposed uh, hotel cart. This is for our security folks specifically. It's not for our collections people. However, we do allow them to put some additional supplies uh, if we have to respond to. And generally, this is set up for a flooding emergency. And again. When we're talking about a flood, even at the villa, we are high up. Uh, if you go look on the maps for tsunami, we're a little high. We're too high for a tsunami to directly affect us. Uh, we're far enough away from the hillsides uh, that we would not be seeing any runoff and flash flooding in that area. And the center, uh, I always say, if uh, if we have a flood uh, from below that affects the center, then get your ark. We're we're all in trouble. Uh, so this is more again a problem of either pipes. Uh, which, which, like I said, has happened. But also, as we're starting to get more and more water, uh, and our building uh, uh, makes me feel really old, is getting old at age 26. And uh, so we did actually have a little bit of flooding with some of the rain, minor flooding, not really flooding, more kind of some drips in some areas as uh, some of the, the catch basins in the roof uh, weren't cleaned out fast enough. Uh, and so some of the water was creeping in uh, and so having this that we could immediately push it along, get into that gallery, get into that office space, that office suite, whatever it is, and start being able to protect the items that we need to protect, whether it's um, the stuff in my office or the irises, for example. Um, emergency bins. This is something that we try to really train all of our staff about, and I'll get into that in a second, is being prepared for the disaster uh, this I, I tell everybody, this is our earthquake kit. Uh, this is our giant earthquake kit for the Getty Center. We have four of these repurposed uh, 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 storage containers. I highly recommend this for any loca uh, location. Have a, a storage uh, container uh, slightly outside of your, your site. This is, uh, this is on our site, that is, but it's uh, not directly within the building. So if there's any problems with the buildings, which is, this is a really well-built location, we have access to a number of the things that we may need uh, that may not be accessible. Tools, uh, uh, a lot of spill stuff, some electrical uh, cables, uh, a lot of first aid supplies, and, and even, God forbid, if we're trapped up here for any amount of time, some basic food and water. Um, we do, communication is such a key. I, I truly believe communication is the number one thing in case of an emergency. Being able to get that information out, telling people what the problem is and telling them how to handle it. And we're very, very lucky that again, leadership here has put in the, uh, been agreed to put in the resources to be able to kind of make sure that we have all of this stuff. Uh, there's a quick picture of our, uh, uh, our, our control room at the Getty Center, which is actually the, the communication hub, as it were. Uh, we do have an emergency line for all of the office phones. We teach all of our staff how to contact the emergency line, even from their cell phones. Uh, though as I go around, they forget it. So I have to, it's a it's a constant uh, thing that you have to remind your staff, what is that emergency number you have to call? We have a, a, an emergency messaging system, the Getty Alert, uh, that we use to get out uh, texts, uh, uh, emails, and a, it's kind of a robotic call uh, that will go out and alert our staff of a potential uh, uh, incident and kind of what to do. We actually used it uh, Unfortunately, the, this past weekend, we had a big power outage for about three days uh, at, uh, at the villa location. So we sent this out to let everybody know the villa was closed except for our security and facility staff uh, who were there to kind of make sure that it was remained safe until uh, DWP was able to get us power again. Uh, we have uh, a lot of procedures for all sorts of uh, different emergencies. We go through these hopefully year, uh, annually, uh, usually it's a uh, uh, security and often facilities will sit down and kind of review what are our procedures for different things. This one's a big one, code yellow, which is a potential brush fire and we have different levels, kind of what are our, uh, uh, what do we uh, do and, you know, to, to kind of uh, 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 prepare, but, but more how do we react. Uh, we even had one, I'm, I'm proud to say, we even had one for a pandemic 
it was written by my predecessor is kind of like, uh, who knows, this may even happen that uh, the February of 2020, we we actually kind of unrolled and, and said, wow, OK, uh, wonder if the, we may actually have to use this. And, and little did we know a month later, uh, we did have some preparation for it, uh, obviously, uh, uh, from that. But uh, it was obviously it was a lot larger of a situation for all of us than we expected. Uh, we do a lot of training. A lot of this training is specific to our security and our visitor services people, but we also expand it out to our regular staff because just doing it for our security staff, and we have a large security staff and, and visitor services is part of that group as well, uh, it is, is great. But again, being able to kind of engage all of your staff, get them all involved, whether it's uh, you know certainly some home stuff, which I mentioned already, uh, but also kind of what do you do at work? Uh, you know, what is that CPR class, that first aid training? Um, we do uh, fire extinguisher training. We actually put out real fires. All of our security staff are trained in that. But we also throughout the year offer it uh, for our non-security staff. And again, we don't ever want them to use a fire extinguisher at the Getty. Uh, we'd rather than just get everybody to safety and call us um, and then we'll handle it. But at the same time, if they're at home, we want them and their families to be home. Because the most important thing is the irises is beautiful. The irises can't take care of itself. Uh, the the beautiful books and the GRI are, are wonderful to look through, but uh, they they don't do anything unless we have the people to care for them. Uh, uh, and and to have that, uh, we need to make sure that they're safe and that their families are safe. So that's a big key uh, for all of the training we do. And and some of the training we do, and uh, we'll talk about that, is even. As things come up, we we figure things out, and it's like, okay, well, maybe we need to reassess kind of what are our what are our uh, procedures for dealing with that, and then we train to that, we drill to that. Uh, we have flip charts. Uh, uh, I love this. This was done by uh, when we first opened the Getty Center, so by one of my predecessors. Uh, these were created for all of our different locations, uh, and uh, I always joke that that shows that the Getty is run by scholars because the idea would be in case of an emergency, you would immediately grab for something to read. Uh, so people have these at their desk, but we really try to encourage them, be aware of what you're supposed to do well before the earthquake. I mean, if you're starting to shake, don't reach around for your flip chart and start reading. You hopefully just jump under your desk. Um, we do have to deal with collections. I mean, uh, most uh, I think a lot of people on this call uh, have their own collections, whether it's, a, you know, maybe it's a garden, uh, you know, obviously the zoo has their own collections, uh, uh, um, you know, art uh, libraries, Western uh, uh, history libraries, et cetera, uh, or, or museums have uh, all these different collections. And we have to kind of talk about that. Now, at the Getty Center uh, and the Getty Villa, we're very lucky because we have a large number of what we call preps. These are the people that, that move the art, that handle the art, conservators that, that care for the art. Uh, and even a number of other people within the museum world, uh, curators, registrars. That, that understand basic art handling uh, so that we really would never want there to be a situation where a security officer has to pick up and move something. That, that's the worst case scenario. However, we do have some basic understanding of what to do and we do train to that. And then we work with our conservators to make sure they're all up to date on kind of what to do because that's always a possibility. Conservators are great. One of the things that they do is they work with our officers. And one of the concerns that a lot of museums have and libraries have as well as pests. Uh, and no, not just visitors, sometimes they can be a pest, but uh, pests like this is kind of, uh, as our officers are throughout the galleries, uh, also in the Research Institute, um, you know, if they see a bug, you know, that's a concern and kind of knowing what to look for and then being able to report it to the appropriate people within the conservation department so that they can make decisions on whether they need to uh, maybe do some uh, uh, cleanup of that gallery. Uh, we actually did have a moth issue over COVID uh, in one of our galleries that had uh, our tapestries. So our tapestries are still not up yet. Uh, they had to take down the tapestries, uh, conserve those. Uh, they put them in these giant uh, trucks, or this giant tank that removed all the oxygen uh, so they could kill off the larvae as well. And they went through and cleaned the entire uh, a pavilion to make sure of that. So this is the sort of information that comes from collaborating within the other departments at your location. Uh, like I said, we, we try to work together with all those people. We do a lot of tabletops. Uh, this one was a tabletop that we did with our collections team. Uh, 
I hope to believe that they loved it because at the end of the day, nothing was damaged, but uh, uh, I gave them a really bad earthquake and uh, there was some damage uh, specifically in an area at the Getty Center that, uh, uh, that uh, holds some of our older uh, uh, medieval paintings on wood uh, that are really, really delicate and really need to make sure that our temperature and humidity controls are just right. Uh, so it was kind of a chance for them to think through what happens if we can't control our HVAC system in that area? How could they move it? Where would they move it? Um, uh, and, and in case of an earthquake like that, who may even be able to get on site? So all these sorts of things, being able to talk that out ahead of time, tabletops are so, so key, uh, even for a place like this. And I said, hey, we have to respond to new things that are happening all the time. We've all been aware of, of so much of the climate protests that uh, we actually did, uh, we, we created uh, procedures on what we would do. Uh, God forbid that ever happens here. And, and honestly, it's, it's happened so often uh, around the world that we had to kind of do this. So we, we created procedures, we created a training. We did a training for all of our officers and some of our VSAs. We worked with our legal department because that's important. Uh, we worked with our risk management. And then we also sat down and did a tabletop with our collections people. And we said, hey, we're security. We got somebody that just glued their hands to the irises, you know, just uh, in this scenario, which is most of the scenarios, just to the frame. Uh, and it's a Saturday and you're not here. What do you want us to do? Um, and so we're going to chop off their hands. No, I'm kidding. We're not going to do that. Uh, but we do have a whole procedures based on that. Uh, and then we actually practiced it. We actually uh, not with the irises. We uh, went in a, another area, had a lot of staff kind of be able to view, and we, we did a, a bit of a participatory drama around uh, what a climate protest would look like uh, and how would we react to it uh, and how would we handle the aftermath of that. Uh, I do want to say before I leave uh, real quick, I'm really happy that uh, uh, my boss, Bob Combs, has been at the Getty for, it's coming on 37 years. Uh, and he got the job uh, here at the Gettys uh, before he became director uh, because he attended this conference, this, the Smithsonian National Conference on Cultural Property Protection. So he's been going for well over 30 years. Uh, I've actually gone a couple of times. I went this past year. It was in Washington, D.C. And I'm really, really proud to say that we are going to be hosting, uh, co-hosting with a couple of other museums uh, here in Los Angeles next September the Nat National Conference on Cultural Property Protection. The Smithsonian runs this. Uh, I highly recommend it for anybody within the cultural world uh, uh, um, here in the Los Angeles area. This is great. You don't have to travel to Washington, D.C. You come here. Uh, it's going to be a three-day conference. It's a great opportunity for us to, A, uh, uh, really show off Los Angeles to people not only from the uh, national, but we're teaming up with ICMS, which is international. We're going to have people coming from as far as way as uh, uh, we're, you know Japan, uh, the Rijksmuseum, uh, um, uh, the, the Prado has come to this in the past, the ICMS conference. So we have a lot of large museums as well as some museums from countries that are usually underserved. They work to kind of get those to people to come here. And here it is. It's in your backyard. Uh, so look it up online. Uh, I hope you have a chance to, to come and join us. It's a great opportunity to kind of network with other professionals that are dealing with some of the same problems you are uh, having. Uh, and, and, and like I said, the first day you get to come to the Getty and, and we'll feed you when you're here. Uh, this is my name. I am the Emergency Preparedness Specialist for the J. Paul Getty Trust. This is my email, lborse at getty.edu. Uh, please, please, please reach out. If you ever want to come up, uh, uh, say hi. Uh, I'd love to take you around, show you some of the stuff we have. I'd love to connect with more people within, uh, you know, uh, within the industry of cultural property protection within the LA area. I really want to thank the city of EM, uh, city of Los Angeles, EMD, Kaylin, for putting all this together, because I think it's so, so important. Um, and that's my presentation. And I think I almost did it in 20 minutes, which is a new world record for me. New world record. Wow. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much, Les. I, we do have a question for you that was put in Q&A. Uh, do you use a specific software for emergency alerts? 
Uh, we do. Uh, it's Alert Media uh, is the company we use. A long time ago, we used um, One Call Now. I know at least one other museum I talked to uh, in Arkansas uses them. Uh, we had, we did not feel that they were robust enough for our location. Uh, so we went out. Now, I know Everbridge is a big one. Uh, I believe the city uses Everbridge. Is that, you guys still use Everbridge? Yes. Yeah. Everbridge is great, but Everbridge is really big. And and uh, uh, so we went with a, a company called Alert Media. It has a lot more functionality we will ever need, uh, but it, it it works. It works quick and we get our messages out. Right. Any other questions for Les? Thank you, Kalen. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure. Uh, awesome presentation as always. And um, uh, feel free to hang out. We have one more presenter to go, guys, and then we were we will wrap this up. So um, our final presenter that I want to introduce is Stephanie Kim. Uh, from the emergency management department and let me make sure that you have co-host abilities all right stephanie kim has over four years of experience in the field of emergency management most notably working in la city and la county emergency operations centers during the covid19 pandemic activation during her time in emd she has worked on several planning projects including the department emergency plan continuity of operations plan and regional catastrophic preparedness grant program Stephanie has also has experience working in the higher education setting as an emergency management and continuity analyst for the Cal State University Office of the Chancellor. And Stephanie has her bachelor's degree in biology and master's degree in public health. All right, Stephanie, go ahead. All right, thank you, Kellen. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. I hope everyone can see that okay. Okay, yep, and everyone can hear me all right? All right, great. Um, so, okay, my name is Stephanie Kim. I'm an emergency management coordinator here at the City of Los Angeles Emergency Management Department. And I will be talking a little bit about our recovery annex, which encompasses a lot of the recovery operations and actions that the City of Los Angeles will take uh, in the event of an emergency. So I know we've had a lot of speakers talk of that, uh, about a lot of great things about how um, we can protect our cultural resources and the actions we could do to do so. But I'm gonna take a step back and just talk about general recovery for a second. And overall general recovery is the capabilities that are necessary for a community to um, basically return to normal functioning. So if they're impacted by an incident, it's what they need to effectively resume routine actions and functions. So, we're all familiar with sort of returning to a normal um, after COVID as a new normal, but that's sort of the concept of recovery. And as we've seen, it could be a long-term thing, but it could also take place as a general process that has short-term recovery actions, intermediate recovery actions, and long-term recovery actions. So that's how we generally categorize the concepts of recovery and things that we wanna do um, after disaster or maybe even during the initial phase of the response. So short -term recovery is the phase of recovery that seeks to restore the community to functioning if not pre-disaster state. So this is where we're gonna see a lot of pressure, especially on the city to resume essential functions and pay prompt attention to the needs of our residents and constituents. And this is gonna be the stage where you'll see a lot of the emergency repairs and minor reconstruction occur. This uh, could coincide with the general emergency response, and it could be the um, actions that are taken actually starting within our emergency operations center. So even while that is activated, um, we could be starting recovery uh, even while the disaster may be continuing. So the next phase is the intermediate recovery phase, which is the transition between short term and long term. It's when you'll see our operations, especially the city, will be transitioning from emergency response over to um, long-term recovery actions. So for um, us, that would be a look a lot like our emergency operations center will begin to 
slow down the risk response action, start to mobilize our teams, and then transition the leadership over to our long-term recovery group, which will then activate and be in charge of our long-term uh, recovery actions. So this will include a lot of actually coordination with our partners, our um, maybe our private sector stakeholders, or if we need for cultural resources, obviously we might reach out to experts, some of whom we've heard today, and um, also, if we need additional resources from our county or state partners, we would reach out to them as well. So this is sort of where we're really shifting our gears and getting ready for the whole long-term process. And then the long-term recovery process will go on indefinitely as we are currently going through COVID recovery, you could say. Um, this could go as long as we need to. It's really aiming to build back our communities and our governments to be more self-sufficient, sustainable, and resilient. So it's really the concept of building back better. Um, we'll see a lot of reconstruction of damaged uh, or destroyed social, economic, natural, or structural environments. And when we rebuild things, we always wanna rebuild it with the idea that it will be better and um, whatever, incident has happened. We don't want anything um, like that to impact us as severely as it has. So that's the concept of long-term recovery. And this will also include a lot of financial assistance for our, our general population, any long-term housing needs that need to be addressed and so forth. So, uh, this is just a diagram I want to show because uh, as I mentioned, recovery happens sort of in phases, but it could all be happening at the same time and even during our response. So if you could see here, um, this is sort of like the general response timeline you're seeing. It could overlap with short-term recovery that could, and intermediate recovery, which could happen days, weeks, or months after disaster. And so it really could overlap. And recovery is something that should be on the minds of all of our emergency management staff here at the city. And it always is um, at the EOC because we're always looking forward and we want to be able to return to our normal. So that's enough about general recovery. And I'm gonna just start talking about a little bit about our plan. And here at the city, we have our greater general emergency operations plan, which dictates a lot of our operations for an emergency, a general emergency, how our city will operate and respond and coordinate to a disaster. As part of um, an annex to that plan, we have our recovery annex. This recovery annex provides an operational overview and organizational framework uh, that will be implemented for all those phases I talked about in the recovery process. And it uh, is sort of a guide for all of our departments to um, know what they should be focused on and how to best incorporate the capabilities of our departments and community stakeholders to support and optimize our recovery. Um, this recovery addicts also includes the sort of concept of operations. This describes what our main goals are for each set stage, um, each phase of the recovery process, our short-term, long-term, and intermediate recovery goals. We just set that out early because, um, you know, after an incident happens, as much as you could pre-plan, you know, the better your outcome will be. So we're just setting those objectives early so we don't forget anything, and that's included in this plan. And then this plan is based off of a lot of uh, great resources from our state and national federal partners. And one of the greatest influences that we used to construct this plan was the National Disaster Recovery Framework. And that is what we use to establish the roles and responsibilities that our city departments and our county and other outside partners who are included in this plan um, that's how we, what we use to, to sort of base those roles and responsibilities for, and that's included on in the plan. And lastly, this plan also dictates how that process from moving from response to recovery happens and how um, we would move from the response organization to our recovery organization, which would consist of our local disaster recovery manager and that long-term recovery group that I mentioned before. Um, so this annex is really a functional support annex. It provides a scalable, collaborative, and operation-based recovery framework uh, that is consistent with the city emergency management structure and our state and federal recovery and emergency management guidelines. It's really um, not necessarily prescriptive in giving the exact uh, actions that everyone will take, but it does 
provide the, the general guidelines we want to follow so that we can scale this recovery response to whatever incident. And so, as I mentioned, the, it is based largely upon the National Disaster Recovery Framework. And so, going from that, this is sort of the main things that we use to organize the plan. And these are the response um, support functions that are outlined in that national framework. And we, you'll see those re recovery support functions there in black. And so the six recovery support functions or RSFs as we like to call them are community planning and cap capacity building, economic, health and social services, housing, infrastructure systems, and then what I'll go on to talk about later, the natural and cultural resources. So these are sort of the main focuses of our recovery uh, here at the city. And we've sort of divided the main roles and responsibilities for our departments into these RSFs so that we are outlining exactly what department's roles are to take care of all of these um, recovery act aspects. The plan also does include some roles and responsibilities for our county partners at the County of Los Angeles, as well as our non-government organizations and agencies. And um, we did want to include a lot of these people and subject matter experts in the development of this plan. So um, those partners that we will rely on in a recovery operation are included in this plan as well. So going off that last uh, recovery support function, uh, the natural and cultural resources one. Uh, that's the focus of today's seminar. So I want to elaborate a little bit more on specifically that one that we have included in the plan and specifically cultural resources. So um, I'm sure everyone knows now what are the cultural resources, but the definition we work off of in our plan is that it's an aspect of cult a cultural system that is valued by or significantly representative of a culture or that contains a significant value or information about a culture. And so it's something that the city does value and uh, it is an objective that we want to make sure that we are recovering from after a disaster. So as I mentioned before, our um, city of Los Angeles make every effort to preserve historic, cultural and natural aspects of our um, national heritage and local heritage through the recovery process as um, my colleague Ken from the planning department talked about a lot of departments have a lot of different roles that they will be doing after a disaster to support this cultural resource recovery. And so here are just the, the departments that are included in our plan just for this re, re, um, recovery support function of cultural resources. And so these are the ones who actually have a role, whether small or large, to play um, in ensuring that all of our historical resources and cultural resources here at the city are um, recovered after disaster as much as possible and rebuilt as much as possible. So we as the city will partner with our, part, our, our agencies outside of the city as well, who will work jointly to conduct, manage, facilitate, and support activities to address any concerns that we have to preserve and or rebuild our historical sites. And as Ken showed, we have quite a lot of um, sites here in the city. And so here's an example of, here are just a couple examples of sort of the roles that different departments might play. Again, it could be small, it could be large. I'm, our planning department obviously has a large role in cultural recovery. Um, that's why he got his own presentation, but here's just some examples of other um, things that will happen for cultural recovery as included in this plan. We also include damage assessment teams that will work with historic preservation officers to determine the extent of the damage to our historical sites. Um, we will, the city plans to coordinate with the state historical preservation office, as well as our state natural resources agencies. But um, here within the city, our internal departments will be very active. Um, things such as like even the legal advice we get from our city attorney on, uh, matters relating to the preservation of these sites. You know, things can be a little complicated if they're if the ownership is more privatized, things like that. And then our Department of Public Works, Bureau of Engineering actually supports all of our city departments and council offices to preserve historical sites. They would um, provide their expertise on any applicable engineering or construction standards. 
that was um, a, just a general overview of our planning, our recovery annex here at the city that we have for um, post-disaster recovery of cultural resources. And so the next steps I just want to talk about because everything I just said describes our current recovery annex, but here at the Planning and Resilience Division at the City of Los Angeles Emergency Management Department, we are actually very excited because we are undertaking a very significantly um, expansive project where we will be doing a massive overhaul of all of our city emergency plans and annexes. So I just wanted to let everyone know that while this is our current plan, things could be very different um, in the coming years and we really welcome any input that you have. And if you would like to be involved in, you know, adding your input and subject matter expertise into our development of our planning for recovery of cultural resources, then please feel free to reach out to me because our process right now is we've just uh, finished updating that overall base plan that I mentioned and we've selected a vendor to who we will contract with um, and we're currently finalizing that contract and we will be analyzing our overall structure of the entire annex plan structure that we have here at the city and then um, in the next two years we will be redeveloping these plans really from the bottom up so anyone who is a, who would like to help we welcome your feedback we're working closely with those departments um, again as we mentioned we work with those departments to get their roles and responsibilities sort of mapped but um, it's a general framework so anyone who has input please feel free to reach out to me so if there are any questions I'm done with my presentation. So thank you for listening. This is my contact information if you ever would like to reach me. And thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Any questions for Stephanie? All right. So um, this will conclude uh, our webinar. Let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. <clears throat> so um, I want to also point out uh, our upcoming seminars that are going to be uh, this next year. Uh, we're going to have a seminar on adverse weather in March, a uh, seminar on safety assessment in May, mass feeding and hydration in July, and another recovery seminar on individual assistance in September. Um, this seminar uh, recording is actually going to be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, I actually put the link there, but I think I messed up the link. There shouldn't be an at sign. So ignore that at sign. Actually, let me edit it out. And uh, the rest of our socials are there. You can feel free to email me, uh, my email below. Um, I'm, I'm hoping uh, you all enjoyed the seminar. Uh, if there's any questions right now, uh, I'll, I'll feel free to type them in chat. Also, uh, as Beth Flowers just uh, typed in chat, uh, if you want more information about becoming a CAM coach, uh, there's a cohort being selected for training in January. So she just posted a link to that. Um, and I just, just to recap, uh, what we learned today, um, I think as Stephanie just pointed out, uh, the recovery, uh, cycle sort of overlaps with a lot of different, uh, phases in emergency management. And I think it's important to look at, uh, cultural resources as something we need to prepare for, uh, mitigate, um, and, uh, focus on, uh, as a community. Uh, so that uh, we can protect our cultural heritage. So I'm hoping that um, the group of presenters here today, uh, you know, provided some sort of um, overall information about, you know, what the landscape looks like. And um, I know I learned a lot and I'm hoping you all got a lot out of it. So um, we'll go ahead and end the seminar unless there's any other questions. Okay. Well, thank you all. I appreciate you attending and uh, we will... Uh, be in touch. Feel free to email me with any questions. Thank you.